said that the graphic that's up there said makes sense as you see Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 6 through 11. Chapter 6 and verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and by want as an armed man. Believe it or not, chapter 6 and verse 6 is to every recollection I have the first Bible verse that I ever learned. Uh, unusual verse. Um, I had at the time uh, that I memorized that, I was probably seven maybe eight years old. Uh, at the time, I had a fascination with insects. In fact, I, as a young kid, had already decided that my life's calling was going to be an entomologist. And um, if you want to know what that is, it is a someone who studies insects. Um, part of the reason was that since we lived that way out in the country, there weren't anybody, wasn't anybody around to play with. My only playmates were bugs. So I, um, and there was there were plenty of them around outside. So um, loads of fun, especially with ants. Had so much of fascination that my parents bought me an ant farm, which is essentially an ant farm with two pieces of plastic with sand in the middle, and uh, you get to watch them build all their tunnels and and. Um, I remember they bought the ant farm with that they had to send off to the ants. And the ants came about, I don't know, two or three weeks later in a little tube. And uh, we opened it up, and I thought they were all dead because they, they put some kind of a chemical in there to put them to sleep. And, uh, but then they, they weren't dead. They dumped them in there, and they came to, and, and uh, they went to work. Hence the, uh, the verse. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. You will never find a lazy ant. And so that is why Proverbs chapter 6 uses the ant as an example. Go to the ant. Now that may be one of the reasons my, my mother encouraged me to read that verse. That might have been, there might have been some ulterior motive that um, may have thought that I needed it as well. Laziness affects believers. I was reading the magazine Discipleship Journal and asked its readers to rank the areas of greatest spiritual challenge to them. The results came back in this order. Number one was materialism. Number two was pride. Number three, self-centeredness. Number four, laziness. And um, the rest go in the order, order anger, envy, gluttony, and lying. I thought it was interesting that of the top five, laziness was number four. People, and, and responding to a poll like that, people do not like to admit they're, they, uh, they're lazy. They're, they just don't. Um, people don't like it when they're called lazy. That's an insult in American society. Even if you are lazy, you don't want to be called lazy. Um, because laziness is, it's not part of the American ethos. You know, it's hard work. And, um, you know, all the time. But the fact is, there's a lot of laziness to go around. Like the song says, when I'm doing Mary a thing that's necessary, I'm happy as a cherry stone clam. And anybody ever heard that? No, never mind. Um, it's very easy to enjoy kicking back. And especially in regard to spiritual things, it's easy to let the scriptures go and the click on the TV. It takes a little bit of energy and discipline to sit down and have your devotion. So, here we're going to look at something this evening that's very often found in the book of Proverbs, but it 
some other places in the Bible as well. It's addressed not so much about ants, of course. It's addressed to the sluggard. We don't use that term as much anymore. Um, but it's a common theme in the book of Proverbs and elsewhere, uh, especially the book of Proverbs. Pro Proverbs chapter 10, for instance, in verse 26, uh, talks about sluggards being in irritation. It says, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Um, smoke is irritating to the eyes of the ant. Uh, sluggards waste time and energy. Proverbs 18.9 says, He that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Sluggards lack initiative. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 24, A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. He causes himself injury. Proverbs 21.25 says, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. And certainly, of course, it hurts the ministry. Hence, in the New Testament, Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, it says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And then Hebrews 6.12 says, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In the parable of the talents, the Lord Jesus called the servant who did not invest his talent of gold, thou wicked and slothful servant. So it is a, certainly a, uh, a major problem, a common theme in the in book of Proverbs and elsewhere, but a, a common problem in life, and it's true of young and old. Matthew Henry, who was a commentator that lived back in the 1600s, said a sluggard is one, quote, who loves his ease, lives in idleness, minds no business, sticks to nothing, brings nothing to pass, and in particular manner is careless in the business of religion, unquote. So in general, it's the person that would rather relax than produce. Again, the book of Proverbs tells us that there are things that we can learn about them in uh, about sluggards. They're excuse makers. Chapter 22 and verse 13 says, the slothful man saith, there's a lion without, I'll be slain in the streets. Uh, sluggards love to be comfortable. Proverbs 20, verse 4, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore he, shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Sluggards love to relax. Proverbs 26, 14, as the door turneth upon its hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Sluggards are arrogant. Proverbs 26, verse 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. A sluggard has a hard time with the Christian life. He, it's hard work to memorize scripture. It's hard uh, sometimes to get up, uh, maybe when you stayed up too late on Saturday night. Um, hard time getting up and getting around. Hard time developing a prayer life because it requires concentration and that's work. So all of this is addressed to the sluggard, the one who wants his ease. And the ant is the, uh, is the means of admonishment. Go to the ant. And imagine this, a person over five feet tall and weighing 130 pounds or, or more is told to let the ant be its teacher. And an ant is less than a quarter of an inch long, weighing a slight fraction of an ounce. A person with the gifts of speech with a brain the size of a whole anthill is told to bend over, peer down, and learn from the lowly ant. Ants are universal in human experience. It, it's interesting to me that God would choose an ant as an example uh, rather than an elephant or a camel or some other creature. But when you think about it, some creatures are confined to certain areas of the world, right? Ants are everywhere. Uh, there's, there's no more common example than the lowly ant. They would seem to be small and insignificant creatures, yet if God was going to choose one creature as an example of industriousness, the ant is really the best one because ants are part, uh, they're in every part of the globe, everywhere. Elephants aren't, camels aren't, horses aren't, but ants are everywhere on the planet.
Someone said this, they said nearly 10,000 different species of ants have been cataloged and most entomologists believe there are thousands more species that have not yet been studied. The largest species of ants grow to more than one inch long. The smallest are less than a tenth of a centimeter. And yet, ants probably make up more than, get this, 10% of the world's total biomass, meaning that ants account for more than a tenth of the world's living tissue by total volume. Now, um, and someone said this, experts believe that all the world's ants combined would outweigh all the humans in the world. Isn't that something? I, I mean, of course it's trivia, but I thought it was an inter interesting trivia. Ants are everywhere. Ants are dynamic in what they do. By most accounts, they are, lift, they are able to lift as much as 50 times their own weight. Ants also have proportionally larger brains than almost any other creature. They work cooperatively. cooperatively. Uh, in some species, they only have a very short lifespan, that of 45 days. But in that time frame, it's almost always nonstop work, building their nests, foraging food for food, blazing trails, uh, and uh, carrying food for the queen back, um, back to the, next, the nest. So, consider her ways, verse 6 says, and be wise. What are those ways? Well, verse 7 says, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. There's an initiative there. Now, we might say, well, that's instinctual. But um, the fact is, is that they do it uh, over and over again without uh, someone prop, uh, prodding them to do that. I worked construction many years ago when we were building grain silos. And uh, sometimes we would be 120 feet up in the air, and other times we'd be inside old silos, and we're going to pour a new floor in an old silo and so on. But there, was, there were a couple guys, one in particular, that if the foreman wasn't around, he was leaning on his shovel. I mean, he was the best shovel leaner I think I've ever seen. He was, he was highly skilled. But he, always, he had a talent for seeing the foreman out of the corner of his eye. And when that happened, man, he was a bundle of activity. I mean, he was, he was shoveling, uh, usually it was gravel or something, putting in a new floor for a foundation, and, and uh, he would shovel like a house of fire when there was somebody around to, to um, make sure, check up on him. Well, the ants don't have that. Um, you know, we really don't know what, go through, what goes through little ant brains. But uh, I've seen insects of all kinds do almost sneaky things. And uh, if you've ever, ever, some of them will, will creep up and look around corners, you know, they, there's thought process going on there among some of them. And um, I'm not going to as ascribe all of that to instinct when there's obviously some thinking processes going on there. Besides, the scripture uses this creature as an example, and the fact of the example holds true. The ant does not have to have someone hovering over them to make sure they work. So, initiative. Foresight. Look at verse 8. Provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Uh, there is, at some level, a knowledge that the future has to be prepared for. God admonishes uh, people to prepare for their future needs. Uh, I've heard a preacher talking about not preachers, not, you know, they say it's a lack of faith to purchase life insurance, that you, that you don't really believe in the second coming if you do that. Um, uh, <laughs> God admonishes people to prepare for future needs. There's nothing at all wrong with investing money right now to, for the for the, uh, future time of need. Um, to fail to prepare in that way is not faith. That is presumption. God never promises to meet the needs of a lazy man. To say that the Lord will provide and not do everything in one's power to prepare, that is presumption. God says, look to the ant who prepares for the future. You should too. Dave Ramsey talks about the consequences of not preparing that, uh, for the future and uh, which can be uh, devastating. 
She provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food. Winter's coming. Make future provision for future consequences. The ant looks beyond the immediate to the eventual. Someone said there are two classes of people who look only at the present, the very young and the lazy. Little children want that toy right now. The lazy man wants that toy now, too. It may eat up the house payment that they have later in the month, but they have to have that toy right now. Fear the consequences of valid reason to move and act. Look at uh, verse 9. How long will you sleep, sluggard? How long? When will thou arise out of sleep? Um, your poverty is coming, verse 11, and your want is coming. So initiative, foresight, industry provides and gathers in verse, verse 8. Uh, in adverse summer, circumstances in the summer, that means uh, what we need to do, we need to do it now and do it promptly to, uh, and do it for as long as it takes. Do it even if it's difficult. Do it even if it's hot out, but do it promptly. Parents need to teach children the value of disciplined, extended work. Um, some of the worst child abusers, in my opinion, are people who are too lazy to make a child work and finish tasks. That's child abuse. Um, I recall some parents in my early ministry who coddled their kids. I remember one boy um, who got himself a paper route, but he's soon tired of it. He had to, he had to go out every day and peddle papers. And um, it was not just, just a few weeks into it that mom was doing, doing his books for him and taking him, him in the car to deliver um, his papers. It soon became her paper route. Many parents think that they are caring for their children and what they're doing is coddling them. Like the joke about the woman who was wheeling her teenage son and around, around in a wheelchair and someone asked, well, can he walk? And she said, of course he can, but thank God he doesn't have to. You know, never mind, wasn't that funny? It, it is work to teach children to work. It, many times it's not a matter of an undisciplined child, it's a matter of an undisciplined parent who, can't, who cannot stick with the discipline to train their child to work. Um, our daughter, Maria, was telling, we just saw her a couple weeks ago at a, a high school graduation for uh, her daughter on another uh, one of our granddaughters. And uh, she said, you know, life would be a lot easier for me if, oh, how did she put that? She said, life would be a lot easier if you guys had never taught me that I needed to work. She goes, I supervise people all the time. They don't seem to have any guilt whatsoever about not working and getting paid. And she said, it's just, I cannot, I can't get paid for, for not doing anything. Life would be so much easier, but you guys drilled that into us. Um, well, that's a good thing, I think. It's addressed to the sluggard, admonished by the ant, and then the alarm, or I've already alluded to in verses 9 through 11. How long will you sleep? Now, these, these are questions. How long will you sleep? When will you rise out of your sleep? These are questions, but these are really warnings. It's like, a, it's like an alarm going off. Wake up! Wake up! There's something coming, and it will be as if you had been robbed, as if you were, you were set upon by highwaymen. So shall thy poverty cometh as one that travels, and that thy one as an armed man. He's talking about being robbed and uh, being mugged. Anybody here ever been mugged? Uh, hopefully not. I'm glad for that. Um, it happened regularly, not to us, but it happened regularly in the Detroit area where, we're, where we moved from. Uh, people walking along and someone comes up and just sucker punches them and that's it. They're out and they get robbed. And, and uh, that's if you know, just one punch, a, a sucker punch, if that, that's just a mild thing. If, if it ends there, it ends up being good. How long will you until you wake up? Laziness messes people's 
lives up. It will mess up your family. One of the greatest threats to your children are, are, uh, are children who do not want uh, to work. Threats to themselves. Someone observed that one of the greatest threats in the ministry is laziness. Uh, they said the short and easier tasks, but leave the long, hard jobs undone. Many men do not know how to work hard, especially those who've been in school for a long time. They, they know how to stay busy doing a number of little things, but don't know how to focus with discipline on the main things. So uh, even in ministry, this happens. Much of the failure in life and of the Christian life is due to just plain sloth. I remember, some of you might know the name Dr. Frank Garlock. Does that name ring any kind of a bell? Some of you shake your head, yeah. Frank Garlock wrote a lot of music in, uh, 40 years ago. Um, I'm not sure if he's still living now today. Um, but he, I remember him saying some 38 years ago uh, in grad school chapel that he said this, most Christians are well-behaved, modestly attired, sluggard. Um, I'm not sure we could even say well-behaved and modestly attired now. But I'd never forgotten that. He said that in a chapel message. And uh, well-behaved, modestly attired, sluggard. Do you realize that in the New Testament, that the commands to awake out of sleep are made to professed Christians. Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time that is now high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. Ephesians 5, 14, wherefore he says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. John MacArthur said this. He said, The apostle also cried out to certain believers in Ephesus, saying, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He was not speaking to the unsaved, to those who were spiritually dead, but to genuine believers whose spiritual lethargy and laziness made them appear and act as if they had no spiritual light. Such indolence is intolerable in light of the urgency of spiritual matters. The fact is that being a growing believer can be tiring at times. It requires effort. We, in our circles, I think in the past, stressed what has been called decision Christianity. And what I mean by that is, is that our evangelists, and I think it's changing a bit from those days. I think some of the evangelists out now have seen that that was kind of a shallow um, objective just to get a decision. But at that time, our evangelists pressed for decisions at the invitation. And we thought that if we could get them to make a decision, slip up their hand, come forward, that we had been successful. But it's easy to make decisions. It's hard to follow up on them. You know, like that old story, 10 men on a fence. You, you, I've told it enough here. 10 men sitting on a fence, five men decided to get off. How many were left? 10. They decided to, but didn't. It's easy to make a decision. Not so uh, much to follow through. We want to make decisions. It's, we don't always want to work. Some people, I think, have made so many decisions during church services and have failed so, long, uh, so many times that they no longer make decisions anymore. It is the follow-up that is difficult because that costs time and that costs money. It costs energy. So people will say, I, I want to serve the Lord, but not if it means that I miss my TV bro program on Sunday nights. I want to serve the Lord, but not if it means I 
I have to be in prayer meeting. Not, not if it means I miss some overtime. Not if it means that I have to have a confrontation with my boss who demands that I come in during the preaching of God's word. I, read, I heard something today. Where did we hear this, hon, about the young man who was the star quarterback for his high school? Was that on the radio? Was Adrian Rogers talking about that? He said that they had scheduled, a, uh, the, another team they were going to play had scheduled a game on Wednesday night. And the coach said, I can't. My star player goes to, he's a church member. He goes to church on Wednesday night. And uh, if he can't come, I know we're going to lose. So we're not going to play on Wednesday night. And I, I remarked to her, I said, what a testimony that is. First Peter 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I remember during high school football, there would be guys who joined the team and then found out it required coming to practice and that you couldn't smoke and that you had to sweat and get tackled and maybe even get bruised up a bit. And then they would quit. I understand how hard it can be. You know, we, we're tired now. I can't imagine. We must have had more energy when the kids were growing up. We had five kids in six and a half years. And uh, I just don't know how we coped with that. We got through it. It was work. I can understand the effort that it takes to especially work all day and then to show up here on a Wednesday night. Some of you put in probably an eight to ten hour day today. I understand that. I appreciate it. The fact is that is work. And but so is this. This is a different kind of work. The lost are lost in many respects because of laziness. That they will go into eternity lost. They see Christians getting up and going to church and they like to sleep in and it requires effort to get up. And so they associate Christianity with work and discipline, self-control, which it is, by the way. And they don't see it as worth the effort, and they will die and go to hell because they're sluggards. So, what is it with you? Is laziness an issue? It is with many. I can say I'm lazy. I, I feel lazy sometimes. Not all the time. Sometimes I feel lazy. And it need, you just need to go to the end, for one thing. We don't like to work. We want to be amused, which is no work. You know, to muse is to think. To be amused means to go without thought. Musing is thinking. It's, it's work to think. And lazy sluggards don't like to think. To think. And so when faced with what God says about the realities of sin and judgment and what Jesus did on the cross for them requires too much thought and they die and go into eternity lost. They will stand in judgment for their eternal souls, not because they've never heard, but because they didn't want to have to make the effort to listen. I have watched, not, fre not here, not, uh, but frequently, I have watched, watched young people play video games during church services. Now, why their parents would ever let them get away with that, but they will do that because they are addicted to amusement and it is too much work to concentrate and listen. There was one man, 20 some, well, it's been probably close to 40 years ago now. Uh, he wouldn't even wait to see if my message was boring. boring. He would be out within two minutes of the message starting. I mean, I'm talking song logs. I'm not sure where he was spiritually. I can, 
I can venture a guess. God says here, go to the ant. Consider her ways. Who sees the future, is prepared for the present, takes the initiative, and avoids the disasters of laziness. There was a man that seemed to be having trouble getting things done around the house that he used to do, and his wife sent him to the doctor for an evaluation, and she was quite quite concerned. And when the examination was complete, he said, Now, Doc, I can take it. Tell me in plain English what's wrong with me. Well, the doctor said, in plain English, you're just lazy. Okay, said the man. Now, give me the medical term so I can tell my wife. Your danger in mind uh, as believers is not that we're going to become criminals. I doubt that anybody here is you know, going to leave here and go, go rob the 7-Eleven or wherever's close by. I doubt that that's going to happen. I don't think anybody here is in any real danger of that. But rather that we become commonplace and mediocre. As believers, that's that's the biggest danger, that we slide into just lethargy. Someone said the 20th century temptations that really sap our spiritual power are the television, banana cream pie, the easy chair, and the credit card. The Christian wins or loses in those seemingly innocent little moments of decision. I think that's true. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, um, we thank you for this little creature that is such a rebuke to us, to our own desire for ease. And um, I pray that every time we see one, that you would remind us of the priority that you place upon industriousness, the priority that you place upon initiative and discipline. And in those times when we feel like just doing nothing and not uh, achieving anything, especially for your sake, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us and spur us, give us initiative to work, to labor, to prepare. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.